There's no other city that shines like St. Petersburg in summer. The gold of the Tsarist era gives the metropolis an incomparable glow during the day. And at night, the sun never quite sets. New rounds are flowing a thousand times faster than usual. The white nights around the clock. St. Petersburg now enchants its inhabitants. It allows you to enjoy life 24 hours a day. Dozens of rivers and canals cross St. Petersburg. Peter the Great founded the city in 1703, and today it is considered the Venice of the East. But the real model was Amsterdam, only with more gold, pomp and swag. Tsar Peter himself was a doer. He personally had himself taught shipbuilding in Holland. This maritime spirit still dominates the city today. Especially in the summer nights, everyone is drawn to the water. On the banks of the Neva, around the open bridges, people celebrate that it never gets completely dark. The splendor of the Tsarist days is sometimes well hidden today. He who knows where to look may discover incredible things. Dirty windows are a sure indication of a spectacular place. A locked gate mustn't be a deterrent. Viktor Fedotov has few inhibitions. You don't go to jail for that, but you won't get praise for that either. It's a little bit forbidden and a little bit... This city palace has been deserted for three decades. Left to decay. Since the end of the Soviet Union, no one has been able to do anything with the palace. In Soviet times, the management of a leather factory was here. The bosses sat here. Bosses like to feel rich. Victor wants to conserve with his camera what cannot be saved in the long run. Nobody can or wants to afford a restoration. Those who have money prefer to live modernly on the outskirts of town. The state doesn't care either. And so the palaces decay. The ravages of time and vandalism gnaw at them. The broken glass seems to have been lying here for a short time. That makes me sad. They don't make glass like this anymore. This is an architectural monument. At least Victor can digitally store the beauty of his city. That is his project. St. Petersburg is shaped by water and owes its rise to its location on the Baltic Sea. The port has always been the bridge to Western Europe. The city was built by Tsar Peter in a marshy area along the Neva River, which connects the huge Lake Ladoga with the Baltic Sea. The cityscape of St. Petersburg is dominated by countless churches and cathedrals. 
At the end of the Tsar's time, there were more than 700. After the Soviet period, there were 140. The Church of Resurrection is perhaps the best known. The Cathedral of St. Isaac is the largest. More than five million people live here in the fourth largest city in Europe. The traces of the time of the Tsars are omnipresent. A few kilometers from the city center is Peterhof Palace, the summer residence. At 11 in the morning, the locks are opened so that the gilded figures can spew water. Originally, Peter the Great had only a small country house here, but his travels to the European courts inspired him. Peterhof is considered the Versailles of Russia. Inside the palace, Maria Korolenko is responsible that none of the precious exhibits suffer. The textiles are only allowed in the showcases for a limited time. The light attacks them. Mary inspects a coat that Tsar Peter himself wore. The condition is stable. I see no new damage, no new cracks or stains. I would recognize it by the fact that in the restored places the reinforcement would shine through. Lighting, humidity and temperature are perfectly adjusted. Everything is in good condition, so the coat can be presented further. Peter the Great didn't name St. Petersburg after himself, as many believe, but after the patron Saint Simon Peter. But in Peterhof Palace, everything revolves around the Tsar, even in the clothing store, where hundreds of pieces are stored. Marie's boss, Marina Kaznakova, wants to check a cloak that is to go to the exhibition soon. Tsar Peter the Great had his own style of dress. He worked really physically, so comfort was important to him. He wore a lot of linen in winter and summer. With some of the clothes, the sleeve was deliberately not sewn up. That then became a fashion element, but he had it tailored that way so that he could work better with it. There's only one thing that they fear here the moths. That would be a disaster. We are doing everything so that it does not happen. We spray everywhere. The favorite of the two is sleeping in a drawer, a blanket from Peter the Great himself. It's said that it was sewn by his second wife, Catherine. The blanket has suffered over the centuries. I can already see breaks in the fibers. Yes, new fractures have appeared. The condition is not improving. This exhibit in the permanent exhibition? There's no need to think about that. Because it's such a fragile material, the black areas break down the fastest because the color contains iron? Yes, iron. The treasures from the Tsar's bedroom are in the best hands with them. The inheritance of Peter the Great is cherished throughout the city, even on the other side of the mouth of the Neva right by the Gazprom Tower, the highest skyscraper in Europe. A bow to the Tsar. The replica of the Poltava, one of his first warships. Peter's passion for shipbuilding was even immortalized in an opera, Tsar and Carpenter.
Maxim Korshunov and his boat building team reconstructed the tall ship within six years, entirely in the spirit of Tsar Peter. Yomadich, Pashka, right. Sashka, Romka, left. Me in the middle. What are we doing? We go up, release the head sail, get it tight and have fun. Today they want to set sail on the new Poltava for the first time. A test run. All maneuvers are new for them. First, they have to release the sail at a dizzying height. In the past, about 20 sailors per mast were responsible for setting, reefing and recovering the cloth. The crew numbered about 350 men. Are you still alive? Stand by to set sail. Come on, boys, unhook the clue line. And you go to the sheet ropes. Not enough potatoes? I'll check what the problem is. Maxim learned shipbuilding in the Netherlands. Just like Tsar Peter the Great, who once traveled through Central Europe incognito to be introduced to the maritime arts. We saw where the problem lies after the first attempt, and we're going to solve it. There's always a rope that gets stuck. So up into the shrouds again. Don't pull so hard. Now comes the moment of truth. All right, get the left sheet tight. For the first time, there is a sail on the new Poltava. Everything here reminds of the spirit of the ruler who brought the knowledge of Central Europe to Russia. The nautical terms that Peter the Great introduced 300 years ago are still used today, just like special techniques for house building and urban planning. Maxim has a lot to do. The first trip on the Portava is due in a few weeks, and the rudder gear has not yet been installed. The Tsar brought this technique from Holland too. With the help of the ropes, the turns at the wheel are redirected to the rudder. This will be tested today for the first time. Without Peter, we'd still be sailing in dugouts today. To port. Works just like 300 years ago. St. Petersburg also became the capital of Russia under Tsar Peter and remained it, with a short interruption, until the October Revolution. The Winter Palace right on the Neva River is still a symbol of this era today. The palace complex houses the Hermitage, one of the most important museums in the world. But it also stands for the end of the Tsarist era. On October the 25th in 1917, a shot was fired from the nearby armored cruiser Aurora into the direction of the Hermitage, the beginning of the October Revolution. The waters mark St. Petersburg and its inhabitants. Vladimir Zarubin uses the morning hours for a little adventure on the Neva. 
the river that runs through St. Petersburg. Crossing the marina, he reaches the broad main arm of the Neva and then turns into the canals to approach his destination. It's very interesting. Every time I sail to the city by boat, I see something new. I steer the boat and I'm focused. But still, I keep gathering new impressions. Vladimir is not on his own. Anyone who has a boat or a small boat goes out on the water as often as they can. In addition, there are countless tourist boats and barges. Everyone's allowed to romp around here, or rather, nobody really cares who is on the canals. These guys are pretty illegal. Fine, so are we. But we sail politely. Don't disturb anybody, not even the tourist boats. I've been here so often, nobody has checked me yet. Vladimir heads for a place in the middle of the city center to pursue his hobby. He's a passionate fisherman, like almost all Russians. But not many dare to cast their rods here, in one of the busiest corners of the city. Most of the time, the best spots are by the bridges, near the piers. The current causes pits to form there. The canals are a good alternative if you don't want to fish outside on the open Neva. Vladimir actually catches something. A little fish, not a big one. It was bitten by a predator. For Vladimir, it's really only about being on the water a little. He has to go past the Peter and Paul fortress and into the suburbs because he has big plans for today. Here in this settlement, Vladimir the fisherman runs a hairdressing salon. He himself doesn't cut hair, but is an expert in hair care products. <laughs> The customers ask me, why are you bald? You sell hair loss remedies? He, of all people, sells hair restorer. Vladimir's wife, Angela, is made pretty as the two of them have a special date tonight. Are you finished? Ready for the show, beauty? Show yourself. Is the makeup ready? Is everything all right? Beauty will save the world. Beauty will save the world. The legendary sentence by Dostoevsky. You can often hear it in St. Petersburg. Viktor Fedotov, the hobby historian, uses the golden afternoon light high above the roofs of the city. Of course, this is not entirely legal either. The summer evenings are the best time for Victor to photograph St. Petersburg for his archive. The rooftops of St. Petersburg are all roughly the same height. This is a special feature of this city, because it was forbidden to build higher than the Hermitage. That's why all buildings are about 30 meters high. So you can take good photos from many places. The city center of St. Petersburg is characterized by old buildings, built around 1900 in Art Nouveau style. More than 80,000 old building flats are set to exist. Victor also lives in one, but not alone. Victor studies art history. His fellow student is one of his 17 flatmates. Hey, how's it going? 
Come in. I'm selecting photos right now. I was at a mansion today. Cool. Is it completely deserted? Completely. People still live in an outbuilding, but the main building is empty. They were looking for something here with a metal detector. What, a pirate treasure? <laughs> There are 18 people sharing one bathroom, one toilet, and one kitchen. This principle is called komunalka, introduced in Soviet time so that the upper middle class dwellings were used by more people. But it's still not cheap. Victor pays 400 euros for his room. Hello. Hello, do you want to cook too? Yes. I'll just finish the pasta and then I'll be off. The roommate bakes Tajik flatbread. Most of us are students, young people who haven't got a real job yet. They sometimes live in one neighborhood, sometimes in another, depending on where they want to try something. But there are also pensioners who spend their whole life in such apartments, which is actually the norm. The evening is far from over in St. Petersburg. This old cable factory has gradually become a cultural center in recent years. And there's a premiere here today. For the first time, the dance group of Vladimir and Angela will hold a public training. It took the two of them a while to agree on the subject of dancing. Angela tried to drag me to dance for three years and I resisted. Then, on a holiday, I was too weak and said, let's do it. We went twice a week, but he didn't like waltzes. I wanted to tango, but Angela didn't. Everyone stands evenly spaced. One, two, three, four, off into the frame. Three, four, one, two, point. One, two, point. One, two, three, four, stop and a short pause. A perfect place for the first dance in front of an audience. Five, six, seven, and one. Angela, Vladimir, and the happiness of the white knight. Neurons are flowing a thousand times faster than usual. We are rookies in the group, but it's beautiful. It's a wonderful feeling. They dance until half past 10. In June, it hardly gets dark in St. Petersburg. The less clouds, the more light in the sky, even in the middle of the night. And already from one o'clock, it gets brighter again. Then thousands gather on the banks of the Neva to experience a legendary spectacle. Right at the Hermitage is the best place. Or of course, from the boat. Then you're right in the middle of it. At one o'clock, the first Neva bridge opens. Hundreds of excursion boats accompany the spectacle and block the river at first.
But of course, the bridges do not actually open to perform a ballet, but to let the ship traffic through the city. The freighters wait outside the center for passage. Pilots like Alexander Romanov take the ships through the city safely. He's on board to assist the captain. Calling the Sinopskaya. I'm sailing towards the Alexander Nevsky Bridge. Will you let us pass, or shall we wait? I think you should wait. Of course, there are collisions, really bad collisions. Suddenly there's fog, and nothing can be seen. That's it. If you're sailing fast, you can neither stop nor turn round. Then it gets dangerous. It happens. Alexander Romanov knows every corner here. He was practically born on the river. I started working on the tugboats on the Neva as a boy. Then I was at sea, in different places, until I came back. They are in the middle of the city, but for Alexander Romanov, the night owls are infinitely far away. For him, the white nights consist only of work. For me, there's nothing else in summer but sleep and work. Sleep and work. That goes for all of us. We take our holidays in winter. It's 2.30 in the morning now and almost daylight again. Time for breakfast tea, a ritual on every freighter before the pilot leaves the ship. Now it becomes most obvious why they're called that, the White Knights of St. Petersburg. The forts of Kronstadt have been used to defend St. Petersburg against enemies coming from the Baltic Sea for centuries. In the Second World War, they built forts of a meter thick concrete. In vain. The Germans besieged the city, then called Leningrad, with the brutal goal of starving the population. About one million people died. Kronstadt, with its military harbor, was a restricted area until 1996. The naval cathedral is dedicated to seafarers with a huge anchor mosaic on the forecourt. The sky over Kronstadt and St. Petersburg magically attracts some flight enthusiasts. Right at the Gulf of Finland, they have established their little flying paradise at an old landing strip of the Soviet era. But not only that, planes are also built here in the forest. At first glance, it looks like a handicraft workshop, but the people around the engineer Dmitry Vasilyev know what they're doing. From simple sheet metal, they build functioning airplanes. It's an art, like painting a picture with oil paint. A thought is born in your head, an engineer's thought. You imagine how you want it to be, and you start working. 
What is born in your head, you can then touch as metal. It's the best feeling ever. Perfect. Some people here are unemployed engineers. Others have jobs and come here in their spare time. Anyone who knows something about flying is welcome. Well, Raven, you are a good Raven. Not only do we build airplanes here, we also have a bird sanctuary. The bird came to us when he was young and became tame. I'll take him away now. After all, work has been done here. The real goal, selling airplanes. They've already built five planes here, but they haven't sold any of the tin planes yet. An airplane like this costs only 60,000 euros. They are sports equipment for hobby pilots. But in Russia, money has become scarcer for this clientele since the sanctions after the Crimean annexation. Just as they reached market maturity, the big economic crisis came. You can try and tie up my side. And that's it, right? Yes, it's locked. In 2014, when the crisis hit, money started to lose value, and it went on and on. You can feel it very strongly even today. And that's why the flying soap boxes are only used by the club members themselves. Anna Cereda wants to become a professional pilot and collects flying hours. She needs 500 for her first ticket. I have about 350 flying hours already. Anna is not worried that the self-assembled machines are not safe. Quite the opposite. There's a rescue chute on this plane, which in case of an emergency carries the whole plane, so you don't have to wear parachutes here. The planes of the Kronstadt factory don't just fly, they are real sports equipment. Somersaults and vertical spins with a spectacular view on the Bay of St. Petersburg, the trip to the open Baltic Sea off Kronstadt. the outskirts with the high-rise buildings from the Soviet era. Anna sees the Gazprom Tower. And the Peterhof, the summer residence of the Tsar, almost 30 kilometers outside of St. Petersburg. Here at Peterhof Palace, work is being done on a particularly tricky piece of clothing in an outbuilding, a jacket of Peter the Great. Some of it I have already cut off. There's really nothing more to be done here. The fabric is completely destroyed. Now this is a difficult moment. There's almost nothing left. But Maria Korolenko's job is to save even the last shreds. Nothing that a member of the Tsar's family wore on his body is abandoned here. She works on such a garment for months. When I first became interested in this profession, 
All I had were romantic notions of beauty, embroidery and costumes and gorgeous evening gowns. And then I understood that it is a work that needs patience and a lot of knowledge. Very much patience, very much knowledge and so much meticulousness. Tsar Peter would have liked how Mary and her colleagues fight for every thread. The people of St. Petersburg love their city. It has enough green spaces, parks, and above all water for their inhabitants' recreation. In summer, however, it can be very crowded and hectic. Then the city dwellers like to flee from the hustle and bustle. Out into the country, especially to Lake Ladoga, to which the people of St. Petersburg have a great emotional connection. During the Second World War, the city, which was besieged by the Germans, was at times able to get supplies from the frozen lake. Only 30 kilometers away from the metropolis, but a different world. Lake of Ladoga is the largest lake in Europe and is connected to St. Petersburg via the Neva. Vladimir, the dancing fisherman with the hairdresser's shop, also comes here regularly. His friend Alexei Korotkov is already waiting for him. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Get in, go. Charneye is the name of the Hicksville with the pontoon bridge. For Vladimir and Alexei, it cannot be remote enough. It smells of cow dung. The botflies are flying, beautiful. You breathe in with everything you have, and you finally have true freedom. You can put your phone away. You don't have to take care of your wife. You don't have to answer to anybody. You're fishing. Get out of the reeds and go at full speed. There is enough room. The Ladoga Lake is more than 30 times as big as Lake Constance. It is better not to go out too far. It's a wise saying. You have to respect Lake Ladoga. Respect the lake, then it will thank you. And don't wiggle, don't wiggle. Keep the rods straight and crank. With that, you can pull up everything but it resists. This is our first beauty. It's really beautiful. Yes, such a pretty one. In Russian, the fish is female. Their goal is a lonely beach on the peninsula. Fire and camping far away from the hustle and bustle of the five million metropolis, Vladimir and Alexei celebrate Midsummer Night. And one thing has to be present as well. Let's see what God has given us. Tsar Vodka Premium. Well, vodka is vodka. How did you like fishing today? 
It was wonderful. I liked that the fish bit immediately. One does not drink to the future. One should only drink to what has already happened. We drink to what has been achieved. To the good fortune we've had. Stay well and down the hatch. To health with Peter the Great. Stylishly we go through the shortest night of the year. The tailoress of Peterhof Castle has called it a day. Maria Korolenko needs the golden light of dusk for her favorite pastime. On the Neva River, she relaxes from restoring. The easel was given to Mary by her mother when she was a child. While it is nice to protect cultural heritage, sometimes I want to express myself. I studied that once. And when you have so many motifs in front of your eyes every day, you just want to take the brush in your hand and paint. She doesn't have the bridge for herself. A water taxi drops off a few young people who can afford the fun. And everyone may use the summer light of St. Petersburg as one wishes. It is a phenomenon that allows everyone to enjoy life 24 hours a day. Once again, it will be a very short night in St. Petersburg. And during this night, a lot is happening. Every year on the third Saturday in June, more than a million people come to the banks of the Neva to see the parade of the Red Sail. The festival is traditionally held to give school graduates a boost. Red Sails as the icing on the cake of the White Knights in St. Petersburg.